Welcome to University Place Presents. I'm Norman Gilliland. April 9th, 1865, Appomattox. Robert E. Lee surrenders to Ulysses S. Grant. It's the end of the Civil War. Or is it? How did we come to that point in American history? What changed that day and what didn't change? We're going to find out from my guest today. He's Steve Kantrowitz, professor of history at the UW-Madison. Welcome to University Place Presents. Thanks, Norman. Really happy to be here. If we look back at the Civil War from the vantage point of 150 years or more, how inevitable does the outcome seem? Or do we know more now than we would have known 50 years ago or 100 years ago? Well, we certainly have argued about it a lot <laughs> in the last 50 and 100 years. Um, there are a lot of ways of thinking about, about that question. And one way is to look at the uh, initial structural advantages that the Union has uh, over the Confederacy before you know, shots are fired at Fort Sumter, right? Uh, and that is to say the Union has an overwhelmingly larger white population, which is what everyone assumes is going to be the basis of the manpower for the Army. Um, the Union has most of the industrial capacity of the United States. It has a significant fraction, though not really more than half, of uh, the pre-war officer corps and pre-war army. Uh, it has huge advantages. It has um, the Navy, too. It has the Navy, too, although not all of it. Um, but uh, that said, the Confederacy's goal is not to conquer the Union. The Confederacy's goal is to retain its territorial integrity, become an independent nation, or in, in its view, uh, remain an independent nation, uh, and um, gain international recognition, and wait the Union out. So from that standpoint, the defensive war can be operated you know, for, for a long period of time, and uh, with enough uh, tactical moves out of the Confederate sphere of influence, draw the Union away, it's possible to imagine the Confederacy outlasting the Union. And indeed, that's the, at the cornerstone of Confederate strategy, is doing that. There's another way to think about that, and, uh, um, uh, about that question, and that is to go a little later in the war and identify turning points, points where Confederate strategy seems to fail. You know, the failure to achieve international recognition, the failure... Um, to really deal a significant blow to the Union during any of its invasions, uh, in 62 or in 63 especially. Uh, the failure at Gettysburg in 1863 is often considered the turning point of the war. You know, battle fought deep in northern soil in Pennsylvania uh, and uh, the, the route, really, for the Confederacy and um, you know, chased back to the Potomac by, uh, by the Union. Um, we can move a little farther into the war and this is where I think the arguments get stronger, uh, to Lincoln's election, re-election, in November 1864, um, to the, the campaigns that follow, uh, to the March to the Sea, which is taking place at that very moment, um, and then uh, to the climactic battles of the winter and spring of 1865. And in that moment, it becomes really hard to see how the Confederacy can, can survive, how it can retain territorial integrity, how its armies, how it can continue to put armies into the field, that can, that can fight the Union or even fight holding actions against the Union. Um, and the Union has also uh, achieved the kind of military leadership, finally, uh, that can stand up to Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia. What did the Confederacy need to get that international Acknowledgement, recognition that you mentioned, and was slavery a uh, handicap? Slavery for that? was a huge handicap in that. Um, what the Confederacy needed was for the economic interest of British uh, mill owners and mill workers to outweigh the anti slavery convictions and ideology of the British Empire. And Which was a strong ideology, wasn't it? It was They've a been, very, uh, very strong. Britain. Intercepting the slave trade for years. Britain in the 19th century. Uh, as an empire and as a people built a conception of themselves as the anti-slavery empire, as an empire that, uh, whose fundamental goal was the freedom, believe it or not, of, of human beings. And, uh, or a fundamental goal of that empire was the freedom of human beings, in which slavery, chattel slavery, the ownership of human beings, would not be tolerated. Uh, in which the international slave trade would not be tolerated, in which, in which slavery itself would not be tolerated. Now, all kinds of other unfreedoms and uh, oppressions were, in fact, part of the British Empire, but slavery was not, at least in principle. And so the Confederates, uh, to the degree that they believe that uh, King Cotton will overmatch anti-slavery, they miscalculate. Uh, they miscalculate fairly grievously. That miscalculation is also a material miscalculation. Uh, 
uh, uh, slave-produced cotton is so successful as an industry in the late 1850s that by the eve of the Civil War, there are these giant surpluses of cotton sitting on the docks in Liverpool and elsewhere. And so actually, uh, the Confederates' uh, attempt to blackmail Britain uh, into recognizing them by embargoing cotton fails for two reasons. It fails because the Union blockade eventually prevents them from shipping it even if they wanted to, and it fails because there's enough cotton for a while. Uh, so it's a, there's a series of miscalculations that are rooted in, in Southern slaveholders' um, need to believe that their might made them superior fundamentally. Here's something we could talk about for a few days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Compare the uh, unity of the North with the unity uh, of the South. Yeah. So both the, the North and the South are, are fictions, right? <laughs> um, uh, from... from from Lincoln's perspective, from a Union perspective, uh, or Unionist perspective, I should say, the Confederacy is a rebellion. It's not a unified region. It's a, it's a rebellion of political elites against an election, against duly constituted government, uh, basically looking at the results of election, saying, we don't like that, we're taking our ball and going home, for which there's no provision in the Constitution. <laughs> and furthermore, Lincoln and uh, and, and many other northern, uh, Northerners believed that this didn't represent the will of the people of the South. That even the secession conventions through which uh, the, the southern states, or 11 of the southern states left the Union, uh, were, were tyrannical exercises. Uh, and to some degree that was true. Um, some of those happened with great unanimity, with great speed. Others took a long time and happened with the threat of arms and, and other, uh, uh, other kinds of undemocratic activity. So the Confederacy uh, goes into the war only unified by um, some sense of local allegiance and by Lincoln's uh, calling out of the volunteers to suppress the rebellion. And that galvanized the South. Exactly. To the same, in the same way, the Union goes into the war mobilized by the firing on Fort Sumter. Um, if you look at, uh, you, you can look at the, the most famous print of 1861 in the Union is this print of Fort Sumter being fired upon. It appears first, I think, at Harper's Weekly or Frank Leslie's magazine, and later gets colorized and people have it up on their walls. It's like a picture of the Twin Towers. It has that kind of emotional force. It reminds you of just the, the grievous assault on our, on our basic principles that's taken place, right? How... Uh what shall we say, authorized, was that attack by any central authority? Or was that a field commander making a decision on his own? That was South Carolina making that decision fundamentally. Um, that was South Carolina's um, now secessionist leadership uh, authorizing that activity. Um, you know, uh, it, uh, the, the Confederate government had uh, it been established in Montgomery in February of 1861. Uh, it would move to Richmond uh, very quickly. Uh, to be nearer the seat of action and nearer uh, to Confederate manufacturing capacity in Richmond, um, uh, and just nearer lines of communication. But um, uh, authorized, yeah, it was authorized in some sense. They, they know what they're doing. It's not an accident. Um, they give the, the, the job of firing the first cannon to an old fire-eating secessionist, a planter, planter intellectual named Edmund Ruffin, 60-year-old uh, white plantation owner who uh, becomes a private in a Confederate volunteer regiment, <laughs> makes a uniform for himself, and comes up uh, to Charleston, or comes down to Charleston, I should say, from Virginia, um, and, and is allowed to pull the string that fires the first <laughs> shot on Fort Sumter. So it's very, it's choreographed, not just it authorized. Is, it is, almost, as, almost like a press event then. Very much so. Let's go forward then. Yeah. April of 1865. What are the Confederates' hopes at this point when so much has been destroyed, so yeah. much has been captured yeah. by the Union? Yeah. The Western armies of the Confederacy have been scattered. There are still uh, Confederate armies in the field in the West, but they're, they're very small uh, and separated from one another. Uh, and they're being pursued by larger Union armies um, and cavalry. Uh, the, the remaining Confederate armies in the east are Johnson's forces, which are in North Carolina, and Lee's forces, the Army of Northern Virginia, the most famous Confederate fighting force. Uh, Lee's fighting force has a nominal strength of 60,000 men. There are probably 30,000 men in the field with him 
when they surrender, which means that 30,000 of his men are AWOL, um, just about. Some of them have been, you know, some of them are casualties at that point, but, but almost 30,000 men are AWOL. The army has evaporated in the sort of cold light of that springtime's realization that the Confederacy was not going to win. It's kind of an accelerated situation, is the, the more who uh, go AWOL, the more we think on top so. of that, who will go AWOL? Yeah, the spiraling yeah. Once, situation. Once the, as is, you know, contemporary military sociology would say, once unit cohesion begins to fail, <laughs> you know, it really can <laughs> fail, right? Uh, and that does seem to be what happens. The the members of, of Lee's army just begin to melt away and go home, because they're more worried about the fate of their farmsteads and their families than they are about this sort of growing fiction of of the Confederacy which at this point really is symbolically represented by Lee's army and the flag of Lee's army. What we think of as the Confederate flag today is not the flag of the Confederate States of America. It's a battle flag. Yeah, it's the battle flag of the Army of Northern Virginia. It's very telling um, for what for what Confederate nationalism was and was not about. Um, so uh, there's Lee's army in, in Virginia uh, being pursued by the Army of the Potomac. There's Johnson's forces now being harried by uh, Sherman's forces uh, in North Carolina. The hope is to link those armies up and, and live to fight another day. But by April of 1865, uh, Petersburg, Virginia has fallen to the Union, which means it's the last railroad bridgehead connecting the capital, Richmond, to the rest of the Confederacy. So once Petersburg falls, Richmond has to be evacuated. The Confederate le leadership has to leave Richmond, which and, means... And go where? And go where, <laughs> exactly. There's a very, you know, a, a very a shrinking number of roads and railroads that one can use uh, to escape the Union Army. The Confederacy is starting to look less like uh, some kind of territorial unit and more like an archipelago of, of loyalties. Uh, and, and so that, it's into that maelstrom that Jefferson Davis and his cabinet flee, carrying money and Confederate records and you know some dozens of people and soldiers uh, as they head south, um, trying to get away from the Union perhaps uh, even to go to Cuba or somewhere else and, and become a government in exile, but um, that doesn't happen. So when, when Robert E. Lee you know, looks at the facts on the ground and realizes that he is about to enter into a, a, another battle with Grant's army, he can't win, he asks Grant um, for peace. Grant doesn't have authority to give him peace. Grant's just, the peace has to be negotiated between powers. What does that mean, a ceasefire? Or so a surrender is what, is what Grant insists on. He wants Lee to surrender his army, which is all Lee has authority to do and all Grant has authority to demand. And that's what, that's what Robert E. Lee does on April 9th. He surrenders the army of Northern Virginia uh, to, uh, to, to his, his adversary, Ulysses S. Grant. Much has been made of the terms, the generous terms that mm -hmm. Grant gives to Lee and his yeah. surrendering army. What kind of uh, authority did Grant have and what kind of precedent did he have for that kind of lenience? Well, the military commanders in the field, and it's something I think we'll come back to, had a great deal of leeway uh, when it came to what they would and would not do. Now, again, as it's important to stress, Grant knew he didn't have the authority to negotiate terms of peace between the Union and the Confederacy. And so whatever uh, Lee asked for in, in, in those ways, he knew he wouldn't and couldn't give. But when it came to the treatment of uh, Confederate soldiers, uh, of, the, of, the of the members of, of Lee's army, that is, uh, and of Lee himself, very much within Grant's purview. And w so what was the uh, precedent for that kind of leniency? Well, the, the, there's long-standing precedent of uh, European, um, European commanders treating one another as gentlemen, you know, people not subject to the terms of total war, of post-war trials and imprisonment and uh, all kinds of recrimination, but rather, the terms are going to be negotiated by the diplomats now, uh, but you can withdraw withdraw your armies, go back, plant your fields. There, there was precedent for that. Was that there was, precedent during the Civil War? Well, there's lots of things, and we can, we can talk about the, um, uh, in fact, a topic we should probably move to is to, to think about the, the terms in which soldiers were allowed to go home during the war, or at least... Uh, not to it's be a curious imprisoned. thing, isn't it? It is. This concept. We're going to get to parole in just a minute, but you, yeah. uh, we want to touch briefly on this march to the sea that you mentioned earlier and yes. Sherman. Yes. Uh, so uh, Sherman, uh, Sherman's forces take Atlanta uh, in, in the very late summer, and they uh, begin uh, 
making preparations for a march across Georgia. And there, unlike many other phases of the Civil War, Sherman understands his task to be the task of a Western commander, and that is to bring the war to the population in a way that makes it clear what the stakes are. Not a gentlemanly war, but something more like a total war. Now, I should say, when we say total war in the 21st century, what we think we mean is the indiscriminate murder of civilians, and that is not what happened on Sherman's march to the sea. Uh, in fact, there's a, there's a pretty uh, serious effort, though not a totally successful one at all, uh, to restrict uh, actions against civilians. There are many actions against civilians by Sherman's army, as there were by other armies in the field during the war, but it is not a targeted campaign to kill civilians. It is, however, a scorched earth policy. They're burning barns and they're burning supplies and they're living off the land. So they're not, they're not tethered to a supply chain. They're moving across the Georgia landscape toward the Atlantic coast, making it clear that this is an army of victory and it will not take anything less than, than total victory as an answer. And so when they arrive at, at the coast at Savannah, just before Christmas, um, it's uh, remarkable and important that General Sherman arrives in this beautiful city of Savannah and nobody burns a thing, really. He, he saves the city, as he puts it, he, as a Christmas present for President Lincoln, presents it to him sort of figuratively. Sort of a mixed blessing um, for uh, the Southerners. Yeah, although very good if you into like the architectural history of Savannah. Right? Yeah, for sure. Um, so by, uh, by Christmas of 1864, uh, Sherman and a huge army and then uh, tens of thousands of camp followers uh, of refugees, of former slaves, uh, of all kinds of people are following his army uh, into uh, coastal um, Georgia and South Carolina, where there are also tens of thousands, in fact hundreds of thousands, of former slaves who have been under uh, Union occupation and living as more or less free people for two or three years uh, since the Union invasion of the coast earlier in the war. And so Sherman arrives at the coast with a, a, a pretty important set of decisions to make. What to do with all these people? He's got to go continue fighting. He's got to take his army north up the coast. He's got to, you know, find Johnston's army, eventually find Lee's army, hook up with Grant's army. He's got a lot of work to do. He cannot have tens of thousands of people following his army, and he, he needs to do something with them. And so he goes to hit the, the leadership on the ground in, in Savannah and in the, in the Sea Island districts of South Carolina. He says, what do we do? He said, well, most of the people here who we need to deal with are former slaves. Let's ask them what we need to do. And they convene um, under the auspices of a, a, a series of, of government emissaries. They convene a, a number of, a, a dozen or more black ministers who have been serving the population of freed people on the coast. And they bring them together and they, they sit down, uh, Sherman and people from the War Department and civilians, and they, they sit down and they say, what do you want? And what they say is, we want the protection of the government and to help the government maintain uh, our, ourselves and our freedom. Um, we want land that we can call our own and the ability to farm it. Sherman thinks about that. The War Department thinks about that. And in January, Sherman issues Special Field Order 15, which is the basis for uh, the slogan, 40 acres and a mule. And it grants to uh, the households of individual freed people such title as the army may convey, not, not clear title, such title as the army may convey to 40 acres of confiscated land that had once belonged to the planters of the Sea Islands um, and surplus government draft animals to use on that land. That's the basis of 40 acres and a mule. And once that's set up, the refugees have been following Sherman's army, and uh, the freed people who've been farming under other kinds of contractual arrangements on the coast begin to settle as a sub black southern yeomanry, really the first substantial black southern yeomanry that there had been. Uh, and um, then Sherman is free to take his army absent tens of thousands of camp followers pursuing Johnston, which he then proceeds to do. Well, shrewd and successful strategy. Indeed. But it does it does it provide some kind of then precedent for what Grant's going to offer to Lee at uh, Appomattox? Well, does it provide? Uh, that's a great good question. Um, it's a it's pragmatic. It's generous uh, in the sense that it breaks the kind of conventional rules of uh, what people had imagined was possible. 
certainly of what Sherman, who was not an abolitionist, <laughs> thought was imaginable uh, before that. Um, that breaks the rules maybe more than, uh, than Grant's terms to Lee, I would say. It certainly had a vast repercussion, didn't it, it from did. what you say? Yeah. Well, let's uh, kind of enter a little photo gallery now of the, yeah. <laughs> this particular part of the Civil War. You mentioned yeah. the March to the Sea, mm -hmm. and we have an image of that here, mm -hmm. and it uh, gives you some notion of the scope of it and uh, the, yeah. the, the look of it. Yeah. Uh, it's been described as uh, a column of men spread out over th a field 30 miles wide moving across the Georgia landscape. Uh, and, you know, you will, <laughs> if you travel through South Georgia, you will, you will hear people say, Sherman came through here and burned everything in sight, and this barn is from 1844. <laughs> you know, uh, so they did burn everything, right? It's, it, uh, the Gone with the Wind version of this is, is overstated. Uh, but they did bring a, a lot of destruction, uh, and they meant to. Uh, as Sherman put it, he wanted to make war so terrible that men would sicken of it. Should I ask about Atlanta and whether that was deliberately burned or accidentally? If you want to talk about it for another hour. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're tap we'll save that. that for another day. <laughs> you did mention parole, though, and here's an interesting yeah. phenomenon. It, it, it seems gentlemanly in its way, uh, quaint yeah. today. Yeah. When the Civil War begins, there's no tradition of prisoner of war camps. There's no tradition of holding large numbers of enemy combatants prisoner during wartime. Nobody's set up for it. Nobody thinks it's necessary. There's a long-standing Euro-American tradition called parole. Parole. You give your word. That's what parole means. And uh, parole is a certificate that you sign. You can see it right here, uh, where you promise that if released, you will not fight again until you receive formal word that you, as a, a paroled prisoner, have been exchanged on paper for another paroled prisoner on the other side. Once that has happened, you're free to rejoin your unit and fight again. If two things can go wrong here. One is, if you refuse to, to uh, obey that, you can be executed if you're caught again. They don't have to do anything nice to you again, right? The other thing is, if the parole system breaks down, if, if you're not exchanged for someone after a certain period of time, you need to turn yourself in to the enemy's headquarters. Wow. And the idea of someone That's, doing that is yeah. just surreal, but it that is. is what the parole system is uh -huh. designed around. And the parole system worked pretty well um, into 1863. It, it collapsed uh, due to a combination of factors, chiefly the Confederates you know, desperate, their starvation for manpower. Um, they had recruited virtually every able-bodied white man they could find. They couldn't afford to swap one-to-one. They couldn't, one to they one. couldn't afford, and particularly when the Union insisted the prisoner of war uh, cartel apply to the parole system, apply to black soldiers as well, because the Confederates, uh, in principle, could not accept that black soldiers were legitimate combatants. They were rebellious slaves and needed to be treated like that. Now, they weren't, because that would have created all kinds of other problems uh, in general treated like that, but... Um, they sometimes were, and it caused enormous problems uh, for the Union and the Confederacy. It's remarkable to think that uh, in 1865, Lincoln visited Richmond, or what yeah. was left of it. Yeah. So Lincoln, yeah, Lin Lincoln walks from the docks, and uh, he's got sailors with him as his security detail. Um, he's very tough guy. He's been <laughs> serving with the Union <laughs> Navy, right? Um, not people you'd want to mess with, but mostly he's protected in defeated Richmond by former slaves, by you know the now freed people of Richmond. The Union Army has entered Richmond. Virginia, this part of Virginia, was covered by the Emancipation Proclamation. If the Union Army's there, these people are free, mm -hmm. and they understand Lincoln as an important engine of their liberation. And so, between the sailors and the and the freed people. Lincoln is very secure walking through what had up until days before been the enemy's capital. Uh, that surrender at Appomattox has yeah. been, um, I suppose, idealized many times in yes. art in particular. And this image is an idealized version of it. This is from 20 years later. This is an image from 1885. Even in Grant's autobiography from 1883, I think, he talks about this and there was already some myth about why Grant was dressed as a private mm -hmm. and Lee dressed in a resplendent general's uniform for the huh. occasion. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Grant kind of downplays that. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways of thinking about this, and certainly the, the Lee biographers uh, have a lot more to say about this than I do. But Lee understood uh, that he needed to 
represent his surrender in a certain way, that he did in fact represent Confederate power and the moral legitimacy of, of the soldiers who'd been in the field, and he needed to represent himself in that way. He was also a gentleman of the old school, meaning uh, a gentleman of the Southern slaveholding class and of a very genteel version of that, and he, he, he knew that presentation, the, the, the one's exter exterior mattered a great deal in that world, much more than it did in Grant's world. It's uh, almost Grant, like Grant a, con comes, a yeah. contradiction or a, 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 what would you say, a contrast between uh, what uh, Mark Twain referred to as Sir Walter Scottism, this kind yeah. of idealized yes. aristocracy versus yeah. the very pragmatic industrial yeah. image that, uh, uh, a that kind Grant of a, had. Grant is kind of a, a, a man of a shopkeeper's world. Mm -hmm. Lee is mm -hmm. a man... Lee comes from a world where appearance is crucial, where uh, if a slaveholder can, does not exude authority, he doesn't stay a slaveholder very long. Right? Yeah, well, that's and it wasn't true. the same thing in Grant's for, world before the war. Different, different stakes, for sure. Yes. For sure. Yeah. Another contrast between Abraham Lincoln and his successor after the assassination. Yeah. So Lincoln and Johnson. Lincoln and Johnson. Um, you know, if, if one were to look at the early biographies of these men and guess which of them was going to be <laughs> later seen as the hero of emancipation and which is the goat, you might have to put your money the other way around. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's true Lincoln, on paper. Lincoln had grown up in Kentucky uh, and, and moved to uh, uh, Illinois in a moment when people were still talking about trying to reestablish legal slavery in Illinois. Um, and Lincoln was very clear that he did not think that black people were the equal of white people. And he said so in 1858, and he said so in slightly more muted terms to a delegation of black men in the White House in 1862. And he really had been um, very the, clear that this was a white man's republic. In there. favor of black immigration, wasn't he? Yes, he was. And he pursued it uh, on and off uh, throughout much of the war. Um, Johnson, on the other hand, had positioned himself as the foe of the Southern aristocracy. He'd been uh, the, the friend of the common white man in Tennessee. He himself had been a slaveholder, but not a large one. Uh, and he had really positioned himself as the kind of mm, white populist Democrat of, of the 1850s. And um, in fact, he refuses to join the Confederacy. He refuses to leave his seat in... in uh, oh, really? Yeah, that's why he's, he's still there representing a Tennessee in the United Wouldn't States Senate. Wouldn't acknowledge the No, he's separation. the only U.S. Senator to, to refuse to join, to leave when, his, when the Confederate delegation does. He stays in the Senate. That's why Lincoln picks him as his running mate in 1864. When, when Lincoln runs for re-election, He's in a tough race against George McClellan. He's really worried about losing uh, 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 a broad coalition of white Northerners who think the war's not going very well. There have been riots in New York City in 1863. When Lincoln runs for re-election in 1864, he doesn't run as a Republican. He runs as a Union Party mm -hmm. candidate. And the, what he does to do that is drop his abolitionist uh, running mate from Maine, Hannibal, Hannibal Hamlin, Hamlin yeah. and pick up this you know, scrappy Democrat from Tennessee, Andrew Johnson. It's a union party. It's a, it's a, it's a two-party ticket. The black soldiers were fairly easy to recruit for the Union Army? Well, it took some doing. Did it? It did take some doing. Black, soldier, black men had volunteered to serve the Union from northern cities uh, at, 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 at secession. So when the shots are fired at Fort Sumter, Black communities all over the North hold indignation meetings. They volunteer their services. In many cases, actually, those black communities have been asking for the right to join their state militias for a decade or more. It really and is been, based on state militias primarily, yeah. isn't it? And they've been refused and refused and refused. And here and there, a symbolic unit has been admitted, but mostly they haven't been. And the state where they're first, uh, where, that first opens recruiting to black men, by, you know, federal government allows the governor of Massachusetts to begin recruiting for a black regiment. Uh, at the end of 1862. Was that the famous 54th? The 54th Massachusetts, that's right. So Governor John Andrew goes out into the world and says, okay, we need to enlist black men in the Union Army. What do we do? And he gets his brain trust of uh, white abolitionist leaders, and they look around at each other and say, we better talk to the black activists. And so the, the white brain trust then basically turns the recruiting over to the black activists who actually know the people on the ground who can do this. And what the black activists discover is there's some resistance. Is Not there? resistance because they don't support the Union against the Confederacy, um, but because they don't believe that the Union is fighting a war of emancipation. They don't believe it yet. 
This, um, is, this is pre or post-1863? This, this, this is just before the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, but even after the Emancipation Proclamation, they, in fact, begin recruiting for the 54th on the promise of equal pay uh, and uh, equal treatment. And then, lo and behold, they discover they're not going to be paid the same wages as white soldiers. And there is actually a movement to boycott the 54th among black activists. It's not terribly successful, but, you know, the 54th marches through Boston in, in May of 1863 uh, on its way to South Carolina. And uh, there are a thousand men, a thousand black men in that regiment. About 40 of them are from the city of Boston. Really? Yeah. So many black Bostonians feel that it's not okay to serve in a unit that's not being offered terms of absolute equality because black soldiery is going to be the ticket to equal citizenship. And if we're being treated unequally from the get-go, no way. What uh, was the application or the use for black soldiers? I mean, uh, of course, they'd be an extreme, doubly dangerous situation if they were fighting Absolutely. Confederates and certainly if they were captured. Yep. And there were instances of that, yep. too. There were massacres at Fort Pillow yeah, Fort and Pillow, at the Crater, right. yeah. yeah. Uh, but were they ever uh, used, uh, say, for um, fighting out west, uh, which would relieve some of the pressure on the uh, Union? They uh, were, Army? and one of the first black units to be mobilized, uh, 7th Cadence Cavalry, um, includes black soldiers. Uh, and there are other units in the West, and black units are moved to the West, and they do a lot of uh, garrison duty and fatigue duty, digging and entrenching. Um, and actually, uh, for that reason, die of disease at higher rates than white soldiers do, uh, because an army that sits is an army that begins to die of disease. Right. And garrison and fatigue duty do both of those things. Um, well, they were on a lot of burial details, too, which I suppose yeah. uh, include... Uh, expedited that problem. Also very, a very, very dangerous uh, line of work, yeah. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, black soldiers doing that kind of work out west and growing number as the war goes on because recruitment does begin to build and become very successful and the first regiment, uh, the 54th and then its sister regiment, the 55th, have to be recruited from all across the north, the upper north and Canada, but later on uh, individual states are very easily recruiting regiments. Uh, even states with this small black population as Connecticut or Island can do it. Um, well, and without states, concern about equal pay? Well, they continue fighting that fight throughout the war. And there are pay strikes within the regiments. So occasionally there are strikes that lead to courts martial and to executions uh, of black soldiers. Uh, there are some very, very difficult and ugly moments in the history of black soldiery before the moment in late 1864 where virtually every black soldier is finally gets equal pay and, and eventually retroactively equal pay. Um, and uh, by the end of the war, that equality, the principle of equality has been established. But it does take until the end of the war. And they are fighting out there in the West? The, fighting out there the, in the this West. This would include the Buffalo Soldiers? Well, uh, later on, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, they, 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 are, they form the core of what become the Bo Buffalo Soldiers mm -hmm. later on. Yeah. And... Uh, one of the provisions, or byproducts, I guess, of uh, Appomattox, was there a Freedmen's Bureau? There must have been even before that. Yeah, so the Freedmen's Bureau had been authorized by Congress um, earlier uh, and begins uh, facilitating labor uh, relationships in the occupied South uh, even before uh, Lee surrenders um, his army. The Freedmen's Bureau was designed to do a bunch of different things at once. It was designed to uh, model a kind of free labor relationship between former slaveholders and former slaves and to broker uh, contracts that could smooth over that transition to serve as a kind of court of really first resort uh, for both freed people and for former slaveholders um, as they negotiated those relationships and generally came because freed people treated it this way as, as the, the place of first resort for, for grievances about the, their treatment, uh, especially treatment in places where there were not any or many U.S. soldiers on the ground. Was there any kind of a political consideration in the Union Army and its commanders to um, maintain the black and white armies in such a way that the casualties would be proportionate? In other words, not to put black units in particular harm's way? There is a variety of different calculuses about that. Um, on the one hand, there are uh, abolitionist and pro-emancipation politicians and generals who really want black troops to have the opportunity to demonstrate their fighting ability. And that explains why uh, the 54th ends up in front at Fort Wagner, 
in 63, in the summer of 1863. Heavy casualties, Very yes. heavy casualties. Um, the cynics would say it proves a black man can stop a bullet as good as a white man. Uh, others might say it demonstrated their, their courage under fire in a way that made, made it more difficult for, for naysayers to say they won't fight, and they'll run, they'll fold under pressure. Because uh, that clearly wasn't any more the case for black soldiers than it was for white soldiers. Um, of course, the, the fighting record of the black regiments is just as mixed as the fighting, regiment, fighting record of the white regiments. So, you know, it doesn't do to create an, a picture of undue heroism here. But it's a pretty equal fighting record. Were they used, black soldiers, uh, in the occupation of the South after they the were. war? They made up a, a very large, disproportionately large proportion of the Union Army by uh, the end of the war because they had rotated in relatively late in the war, had volunteered in very large numbers. The, um, the enlistment rate among black Northerners is much bigger than the enlistment rate among white Northerners. Um, it's about 75% of el eligible black men serve the Union Army. The rate for, for white soldiers is, is much less remarkable. than that. It, the, the rate for black soldiers serving mostly as volunteers actually is almost the same rate as the rate of Confederates under a draft. <laughs> uh, so what this means is that by the end of the war, there are 100,000 black men in the field. That's a very large proportion of the Union forces in the field relative to the black population of the North, which is just a couple of percent. Um, so what it means is that there are a lot of black troops doing occupation duty in the early months of, of the peace. Did occupation duty include such things as uh, suppressing the Ku Klux Klan? Well, it would eventually mean that, yeah, the Klan is, the Klan is formed in the first winter uh, uh, after the surrender and uh, becomes a major force in the landscape by 1866. Uh, its national leader is the former Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest, uh, the man whose troops committed the massacre of Black Forces at Fort Pillow, who had himself been a slave trader before the war, who, for a variety of reasons, you know, this, this is the right organization for him, and he's the right man for the organization. Um, but the Ku Klux Klan is uh, the largest, but by no means the only white paramilitary force uh, on the ground in the South uh, in, in the early uh, years after the war. There are lots of more local organizations and regional organizations that do the same work. And basically, what they, what they constitute is an anti-occupation force. That is a force trying to undo the work that the Freedmen's Bureau and the Federal Army that supports it are trying to do. To reestablish a hierarchy of social and political and especially labor arrangements that force black people into uh, a subordinate position in the society and the economy. Which of course means preventing them from voting, but in 1865 and 6 that's not an issue yet. Mm -hmm. Um, it will become an issue, and the Klan will get involved in that. But early on, it's very, very clear the Klan is about trying to recreate, as far as possible, the economic and social hierarchies that had existed before the Confederate surrender. Was there any kind of a, uh, an extended, I'll call it a propaganda machine in the South after the war has ended to, to speak out against uh, the Freedmen's Bureau, to speak out against the occupation forces? Sure. Although under occupation, it's difficult for you know to publish a newspaper that's calling for rebellion against uh, against Union authority. Remember, this is hard for us to remember because we we're so used to thinking of Appomattox as the end of the war, but but Appomattox was only the surrender of Lee's army, right. and even after the final Confederate armies had surrendered a couple of months later, I think Stan Waddy's Confederate Cherokee Brigade surrenders in June. And I think that's the final Confederate army surrender, although a military historian may correct sure, me. Sure, Kirby Smith uh, out there. In okay, Texas, yeah. okay. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the Union uh, forces on the ground didn't think that they were at peace. They knew that they were an occupying force. They knew that they were still working under the war power. Uh, and Andrew Johnson, as bad a reputation as he has and deserves for his later opposition to all forms of reconstruction and black citizenship, uh, Andrew Johnson understands, at least in the first six to eight, maybe 12 months of his, of his presidency, uh, that the Confederacy is only provisionally defeated, and it need, that defeat needs to be ratified on the ground by a, a significant occupation that, uh, that secures the peace in a meaningful way uh, and establishes the terms for it. Well, from a political standpoint, though, I mean, freedom of speech, even in the defeated South, First Amendment and all that, mm. uh, possible to put out an editorial or editorial cartoon when you're saying something to the effect of, well, 
Congress is against us or the president is against us, vote well, for this, vote for that? There are such things. Uh, it's much harder to do that in the occupied Confed in former Confederacy, uh, the occupied former slave states, than it is to do in the North. Uh, in the North, there are all kinds of uh, vitriolic, open attacks against the Republicans, against Lincoln while he's alive, against Johnson, against the radicals in Congress when they're alive. And those, uh, those attacks um, uh, take the Freedmen's Bureau head on, uh, create arguments that say, you know, uh, if you're a white man in Pennsylvania and you vote for the Republicans, mm -hmm. look what you're voting for. You're voting for a free lunch for the freedmen and more taxes for the white working man. I mean, really, the same kind of zero-sum politics of racial antipathy that we could find in the 21st century. You know, previewed and <laughs> tried out in, in the North in 1866. Um, and that's, uh, that's the beginning of uh, a kind of national politics of backlash against slave emancipation that I would argue we're still living with. We have quite the image here that uh, kind of smacks of, oh, I don't know, something from Roman antiquity or something yeah. in, in the scale of it. Yeah, so this is called mustering out. This is a, a very, very beautiful uh, drawing. It's, a, it's actually a pencil drawing, a sketch that gets turned into uh, an, an engraving and I think is published in Harper's and a, a number of other places uh, right after the war. And it's, it's, an, it's an image that conjures up uh, the dignity and the power and the victory of black military force and weds it, literally <laughs> weds it in this case, uh, to black domesticity liberated from slavery. So the black family unleashed from slavery through black men's force of arms and, you know, implicitly at least, women's activity on the home front. And their prominence in this image suggests, you know, that prominence as well. Were slaves in the South, obviously, uh, well, although there were some in the North too, of course, before the Emancipation Proclamation and after, technically, uh, but were slaves uh, legally married? Uh, what what well, sort of so, domestic arrangements did they have? Right. So slavery, the law of slavery is antithetical to marriage, right? Because marriage in the 19th century especially creates certain kinds of property relationships and responsibilities between a husband and a wife. A very unequal set of responsibilities, of course, right? Coverture, the principle that husband owns his wife's wages, uh, owns his children's wages, in some sense, in a limited way, uh, not for criminal purposes, owns his family. Now, obviously, a slave who is the property of another person cannot own anything legally. Right. Especially cannot own another person who is themselves a slave. Uh, so when there are, there are many, many, many marriages among slaves, and many slaves earnestly consider themselves to be married, it may even be that their owners consider them to be married and marry them or have a minister marry them. The marriage has no legal force, no legal force really? whatsoever. There are efforts in some in Louisiana and a few other places to ameliorate slavery by giving those marriages some legal force and saying that married slaves can't be separated from one another by sale. But those moves are completely impossible to sustain because the eco economics of slavery require that slaves be separated from one another all the time. So after the war, were any of these things kind of settled out in terms of the paperwork? So one of the first things uh, that the, the Union occupation is interested in establishing and that freed people themselves are interested in establishing is solemnizing unions that had previously been lacked the force of law. And so what the Union, uh, what the union uh, uh, forces come in and do is create a kind of bureaucratic form that allows people to say, we have been married in our own eyes since mm -hmm. X. These children are our, are our children. And therefore, what do you do? Retroactively create bonds of kinship that are bonds of inheritance so property can be exchanged. Right, so property has oh, clear a, movement, uh, right? Yes, you need that as a legal uh, Absolutely. basis. Absolutely, you need the legal property. foundation for property. I mean, that's and that's what marriage and inheritance had always provided. And now, former slaves are very eager to be part of that regime as well. Were there a, a kind of national conventions of the Freedmen's Bureau and freed slaves? Uh, did it become a, a national force? Yeah. So. Um, Black Northerners had been meeting in convention since at least 1830. 
They've been holding regional, northern national conventions, they called them, but they were really mostly of northerners. Well, here's one here, um, I guess, or, or is this uh, a slightly this later This is one? later. This is actually 1865 or 6, I think. Um, there are a number of conventions uh, in the 1840s and 50s. There are state conventions and national conventions. But in 1864, in Syracuse, they convene the first really, truly national convention because it not only includes delegates from states where slavery has been outlawed already, but delegates from states that are under union occupation or under only partial union occupation. So in 1864 in Syracuse, you have delegates from North Carolina, wow. delegates from Virginia, delegates from Louisiana. Uh, and by 1865 and on into the late 1860s and 70s, you get a national black convention movement that includes African Americans, men, and now women also from all over the United States coming together to talk about the issues that, that are central to their concern. Were there instances in which a former slave owner would actually get in touch with his slave and say, you know, why don't you come back and I'll pay you this time around? Well, yeah, and I, if I may, I'd like to read you one because it's, it's one of my favorite documents. Um, it's um, it, in, in the summer of 1865, a, a former slaveholder in Tennessee named Colonel P.H. Anderson wrote to his former slave, Jordan Anderson, to say in, in words to the effect of, will you please come back? I need you for the harvest. Uh, you can have your freedom and, uh, and wages. And Jordan Anderson writes a long letter, not a very long letter, but a letter worth lingering over back to his old master. It's Dayton, Ohio, August 7th, 1865, to my old master, Colonel P.H. Anderson, Big Spring, Tennessee. Sir, I got your letter and was glad to find you had not forgotten Jordan and that you wanted me to come back and live with you again, promising to do better for me than anybody else can. I have often felt uneasy about you. I thought the Yankees would have hung you long before this for harboring Rebs they found at your house. I suppose they never heard about your going to Colonel Martin's to kill the Union soldier that was left by his company wow. in their stable. Although you shot at me twice before I left you, I did not want to hear of your being hurt, and I'm glad you were still living. It would do me good to go back to the dear old home again and see Miss Mary and Miss Martha and Alan, Esther, and Green, and Lee. Give my love to them all and tell them I hope we will meet in the better world if not in this. I would have gone back to see you when I was working in the Nashville hospital, but one of the neighbors told me Henry intended to shoot me if he ever got the chance. I, I want to know particularly what the good chance is you propose to give me. I'm doing tolerably well here. I get $25 a month with vittles and clothing have a comfortable home for Mandy, the folks here call her Mrs. Anderson, and the children, Millie, Jane, and Grundy, go to school and are learning well. The teacher says Grundy has a head for a preacher. They go to Sunday school, and Mandy and me attend church regularly. We are kindly treated. Sometimes we overhear others saying, the colored people were slaves down in Tennessee. The children feel hurt when they hear such remarks, but I tell them it was no disgrace in Tennessee to belong to Colonel Anderson. And here we hear Anderson, Jordan, switch registers here. Many darkies would have been proud as I used to was to call you master. And he switches back. Now, if you will write and say what wages you will give me, I will be able to better decide whether it would be to my advantage to move back again. As to my freedom, which you say I can have, there's nothing to be gained on that score. I got my free papers in 1864 from the Provost Marshal General of the Department of Nashville. Mandy says she would be afraid to go back without some proof you were sincerely disposed to treat us justly and kindly, and we've concluded to test your sincerity by asking you to send us our wages for the time we served you. <laughs> this will make us forget and forgive old scores and rely on your justice and friendship in the future. I served you faithfully for 32 years and Mandy 20. At $25 a month for me and $2 a week for Mandy, our earnings would amount to $11,680. Add to this the interest for the time our wages has been kept back and deduct what you paid for our clothing and three doctor's visits to me and pulling a tooth for Mandy, and the balance will show what we are in justice entitled to. Please send the money by Adams Express in care of V. Winters, Esquire, Dayton, Ohio. If you fail to pay us for faithful labors in the past, we can have little faith in your promises in the future. We trust the good maker has opened your eyes to the wrongs which you and your fathers have done to me and my fathers, making us toil for you for generations without recomp recompense. Here I draw my wages every Saturday night, but in Tennessee there was never any payday for the Negroes, any more for the, than for the horses and cows. And here he quotes the Bible. Surely there will be a day of reckoning for those who defraud the laborer of his hire. In answering this letter, 
please state if there would be any safety for my Millie and Jane, who are now grown up and both good-looking girls. You know how it was with Matilda and Catherine. I would rather stay here and starve and die if it comes to that than have my girls brought to shame by the violence and wickedness of their young masters. You will also please state if there have been any schools open for the colored children in your neighborhood. The great desire of my life now is to give my children an education and have them form virtuous habits. P.S. Say howdy to George Carter and thank him for taking the pistol from you when you were shooting at me. Your old servant. Jordan Anderson. It is a remarkable letter with many <laughs> currents and undercurrents. Yes. And the thing that maybe fascinates me above all is that it still exists, mm. that the recipient uh, saved it. So there's a slightly different story to that, it turns out. There is a real Jordan Anderson. We saw a picture of him and a real Amanda Anderson. Um, they really did, uh, they were the property of P.H. Anderson in Big Springs, Tennessee. And they did write a letter to him in August 1865. That letter probably was sent to him, but where it appeared uh, was in the Cincinnati commercial. So V. Winters, who was an abolitionist lawyer, uh, the person the V. Winters rec uh, referred to in the letter, uh, sent the letter to a local newspaper in Ohio. It was reprinted in the Cincinnati paper, then reprinted in the uh -huh. New York Tribune. And so now we have it uh, reprinted, became widely circulated in this moment in 1865, and that's why we have it. It's caused some people to doubt the authenticity of the letter, but actually a very fine historian named Roy Finkenbein has actually gone back, is writing a book about Jordan Anderson now, and virtually everything in here can be authenticated. Really? Yeah. So that is the letter as yeah, written. Yeah, for real. Yeah. Uh, it has these incredible, as you say, shifts of tone yes. and voice yes. and uh, irony yeah. and then sarcasm yeah. and We're, sincerity. It's, uh, it's just very powerful. The drama of emancipation often leads us to, to paint it in, in monochromatic tones, right? To, to treat it as a, a kind of good and evil, black and white, the, the forces of the rebel alliance and you know, the imperial stormtroopers, right? But in fact, what we're looking at is a world of the same complexity as ours and people who lived in a variety of registers in a variety of ways, including former slaves. Did the Civil War bring about it overall, uh, not just a black and white awareness, but uh, uh, any kind of a sense that there should be kind of an inclusive society in general, including all races? There was a moment uh, uh, among some Americans in the late 1860s when emancipation had been achieved and Reconstruction was moving forward when the principle of equal citizenship had first been enacted into law with the Civil Rights Act and then become part of the Constitution with the 14th Amendment, when it, it began to seem as though universal humanity, universal citizenship, universal suffrage, e even including for women, unbelievably, <laughs> might be the order of the day. And um, it, it was possible to imagine such a thing. Well, this is a sense of inclusiveness here. Exactly. It's Uncle a, Sam's Thanksgiving yeah, dinner. Come one, something? come all, free <laughs> and equal. But this is really the high tide of that, the moment when the 14th Amendment has just entered the Constitution, the 15th Amendment is about to be ratified, uh, the first uh, black men are entering the halls of Congress, uh, you know, really at, at a moment when it seems like anything is possible very quickly this moment would shut down. This moment, in fact, in many ways was already shutting down as it was happening. Uh, but very quickly the countervailing forces uh, would, would squash this moment, would really smother it in its cradle in many ways and, and leave us with a much more complicated and conflictual world that we live in today. It was intriguing that even in the defeated South, pretty quickly politicians reintegrated into Congress. Yep into the national political scene yep. got control quickly enough to turn things around. Yeah, in some places so quickly that nothing, that no reconstruction ever happens at all, like in Virginia, for example, or Georgia, really. Uh, in other places, uh, the, the weight of uh, the black population is so enormous in South Carolina and Mississippi uh, that coupled with uh, sustained federal occupation and sometimes a reoccupation to fight the Klan or Klan-like forces, Reconstruction could go on all the way into the, into the mid-late 1870s. Uh, Reconstruction didn't have force throughout those states in those years, really. There were garrisons in the capitals and a few garrisons around the states, and in the, in the orbit of those garrisons, uh, there was uh, some semblance of democracy. Um, but outside of those areas, uh, really the rule, of, um, uh, the rule of white men, and more specifically the rule of white men and property, 
uh, became the order of the day. Steve Kentrowitz, thank you for sharing some insights into the road to Appomattox and uh, the road past Appomattox, too. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. I'm Norman Gilliland, and I hope you'll join me the next time around for University Place Presents. <laughs>